Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So we got the crypto market chugging away. Everything's down a bit today. Bitcoin trading at 31,700, down 4.1%. Uh, Ethereum trading at about 1,316, uh, down almost 6%. And uh, we've got XRP down here, down only 2.83%, uh, trading at about 0.266. So, you know, everything is kind of uh, feeling that bleed. Uh, market cap right now, 944.3 billion. Bitcoin dominance still hanging on in the mid 60s, give or take at uh, roughly 63%. Not too much happening in the crypto space right now, as you guys can see by the charts. Uh, this is Bitcoin. I'll put it here on the hourly. Uh, we can see there hasn't been too much movement after we saw this uh, volatile beginning of the year. Uh, Bitcoin kind of calmed down. And, uh, you know, we've seen these kinds of corrections in the past. And I have a feeling that if we were in a bear market already, uh, we would already be seeing uh, more violent swings to the downside. This isn't the case, though. Uh, we are seeing that uh, the volume is just kind of tamped down a bit. And if I can put these uh, trend lines up here, I'm just gonna show you guys the bottoms here uh, and the tops. And if we extend this all the way out, Okay, we could realistically see Bitcoin continue this sideways momentum for quite a while still. Uh, you know, I was even suggesting that we could go as early as March. I did a video the other day talking about that. We could eventually break uh, to the upside or to the downside at any moment, though. Uh, but this is just showing you that, you know, volatility is subsiding. And uh, this is good news. We can see it down here in the volume as well. If I put this back on the daily, we can see, uh, and I'm going to get rid of that for a second. If we put it on the daily, we can see Bitcoin still formulating that bullish pennant, right? We had a lot of bullish momentum for Bitcoin. Let's not forget starting as early as September 2020. Uh, and we pushed up all the way uh, from about $10,000 all the way to almost $42,000. Okay, Bitcoin gaining 300% uh, give or take. So this is still looking bullish in my opinion. Uh, you know, with these large moves, of course, you're going to see longer periods of consolidation while uh, we find uh, that equilibrium where buyers and sellers are happy buying and selling Bitcoin. And so right now it's at 31,000. The market does have to uh, cool down a bit in order to continue its trajectory upward. And, uh, you know, XRP, you know, still suffering from this. We're seeing this uh, same kind of momentum here for XRP. Nothing really happening. Declining volume. Uh, of course, there was the SEC lawsuit, which caused this decline. But we did see a pop up, some optimism here. But right now for XRP, just kind of slowly sliding down. Good news here, though, is that XRP is also forming what is looking like a bullish pennant. So just keep an eye on that. Uh, we've also got this. I saw this from Ian Northern. Flair is about to overtake XRP. I don't know if you guys saw this yesterday. Uh, I'm signed into my Bitru account here, and the uh, FLR to USDT was up uh, as high as 34 cents yesterday. So we did see some enormous gains. I have uh, the FLR pair up here on the hourly. And right now it's trading at about 26 cents, 0.259. But, uh, you know, I get the sentiment. It is quite funny that Flare, a token that we just happen to be lucky enough to be airdropped because we hold XRP, is now at the same price of XRP and even surpassed that price yesterday. And there was quite a bit going on yesterday. Of course, uh, Davos did kick off. And this from XRP Crypto Wolf, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey claims cross-border payments are too expensive. So Davos is happening this year via virtual conference. And uh, the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey mentioned that there were some gaps to fill in digital payments in spite of a flurry of innovation it has witnessed in recent years. We still have some very big gaps to fill, he said. Uh, he particularly mentioned cross-border remittances as the obvious one since they are way too expensive. Cross-border payments being the obvious one where the cost of making payments is too high. Uh, while he didn't mention XRP specifically, uh, his words can definitely be perceived as a nod to the fifth largest cryptocurrency by market cap. Because of its design, the digital asset has been battered by the SEC lawsuit. Okay, and then this article just goes into the SEC lawsuit, which I'm not going to perseverate on. Uh, interesting though, he did mention cross-border payments, all while Ripple keeps expanding the XRP ecosystem. And XRP isn't just going to be utilizing cross-border payments either. I am going to get back to this in a sec. I just wanted to bring this to your attention. The Cryptic Poet here posting this Ripple-backed coil. Google and Microsoft and others publicly introduce open web docs. So another use case, uh, this is going to be happening through coil. High quality documentation for web platform technologies is a critically important component of our shared open digital infrastructure. Uh, today, we're excited to publicly announce open web docs, a collective project designed to support a community of technical 
technical writers around strategic creation and long-term maintenance of web platform technology documentation that is open and inclusive for all. And this is going to be uh, integrated with Coil, guys. As you guys know, Ripple's uh, Spring makes one billion XRP grant to drive XRP adoption and advance Coil's monetized platform for creators. This was back uh, from August of 2019. So we're seeing more use cases in the ecosystem. Cross-border payments is, uh, of course, a pain point and, of course, what Ripple is trying to focus on. And so we're hearing similar sentiments from uh, the governor of the Bank of England, uh, namely Andrew Bailey. I feel like these guys are on the same page. Uh, it is no secret. I saw this from Andrews L, XRP plus CBDCs. This is going to be the key. And guys, yesterday Ripple just uh, published this uh, Ripple 2020 momentum blog. I'm going to leave the blog up here. I'm not going to go through it because I am going to highlight certain parts of it through the rest of this video. This is from Mac Attack XRP. So here's an overview, essentially. Ripple reveals in new report that over 3 million transactions were processed over RippleNet in 2020. So this is significant growth. They announced that they had had a record-breaking 2020 with significant growth in RippleNet transactions. The blockchain payment firm also reported the signing of 15 new RippleNet customers to close out 2020 despite the SEC's lawsuit. According to an official announcement by Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse, Ripple X now reaches uh, more than 20 million users around the world uh, through the XRP Ledger, Interledger Protocol, and Ripple's partners. Ripple is also facing a lawsuit, of course, as we know, for allegedly issuing the unregistered security that they are calling XRP. Uh, Ripple has continued to expand its global footprint. So Ripple CEO Garlinghouse also pointed out that the company has been fortunate enough to hire in every quarter in 2020 to expand its global footprint with the addition of top talent to Ripple's leadership team. Additionally, the CEO also mentioned the growing interest of global customers and developers for RippleNet and Ripple X. By the numbers, Ripple X had a banner year in 2020. We processed nearly 3 million transactions over RippleNet. This is nearly 5x volume growth compared to 2019 the official announcement read. So we are seeing Ripple continue to grow despite uh, a pandemic. And of course, it seems as though, uh, you know, because of the pandemic, it seems that this is the perfect kind of atmosphere for uh, RippleNet to thrive in. There's going to be a push for a cashless society. We're already starting to see that now. And uh, if the pandemic were ever an excuse to push that further in many countries, I personally am not uh, too keen on that idea, but I'm sure a lot of you guys have your own opinions on that. Uh, please do put it down in the comments section. So Ripple Ripple experienced 12x year-over-year -year growth for its on-demand liquidity. On-demand liquidity continued to grow as the firm experienced 12x year-over-year -year growth, and uh, transactions in 2020 had a notional value of $2.4 billion. And the good news is, guys, despite the lawsuit in the United States, customer interest globally remains very strong. And this is kind of the key to this. Ripple can thrive doing what they do around the world. Uh, it's going to be this pain point, this SEC lawsuit that's really going to kind of hamper things. I think at the detriment to Americans, unfortunately, because, you know, the rest of the world can trade XRP right now. And in some countries, XRP is already being utilized. So the team continued to close new customer deals at a rate of two per week across more than 40 countries, 18 of which are new to RippleNet, the official announcement noted. Despite all the challenges that the lawsuit brought in recent weeks, Ripple announced new partnerships earlier this month with uh, Mobile Money, a Malaysia-based money wallet company, and Mutual Trust Bank. Last year uh, was the best year for the blockchain company in terms of new deals due to record customer demand and transaction growth. So this is not slowing Ripple down one bit. And uh, again, I will leave this article in the, uh, this, this insights article from Ripple in the description of the video if you guys want to go through the full thing. Uh, I also saw this from Apex Crypto, retweeting out Ashish Birla's tweet here uh, with regards to some more details. And I wanted to bring up Ashish Birla's tweet all things considered, Ripple had a pretty incredible year in 2020. In my seven plus years at Ripple, I remain insanely proud of what this team has achieved and I'm bullish on where we're going. Diving deeper specifically on RippleNet, we processed about 3 million transactions on RippleNet in 2020 and ODL is rapidly growing. ODL transactions accounted for $2.4 billion in notional value. We planted the RippleNet flag in 18 new countries, so uh, some of the same things that I just mentioned, and signed 15 deals after the SEC complaint was made public. That is important to note as well. Uh, APAC is still our busiest region, which is the Asian Pacific region, uh, for customer demand and transaction growth. In India, we're working with three out of five of the biggest banks in the MENA India Corridor, which is uh, the Middle East and North Africa, if I'm not mistaken. India Corridor, uh, one of the biggest in the world for remittances, is rapidly growing, could be our largest soon. Every customer and partner joins RippleNet with the same base service and a crypto wallet. RippleNet is designed to seamlessly up 
upgrade and add new services when ready. We are evolving from strictly payments into a platform with tokenized services. This is important to note too. We purposefully built RippleNet to get FIs comfortable with using a blockchain-based network for fiat transactions. And when they're ready, flip the switch for ODL, line of credit, and soon to come new products. So listen to what they're saying here, okay? Um, the cross-border transactions, of course, their main focus, but they are looking to prepare themselves, Ripple is, in order to offer new products to new customers, to stay on that cutting edge, to stay innovative. So Berla goes on to say, as uh, RippleNet evolves, uh, so do the types of transactions we process. We started with remittances because they have the highest friction. Uh, these still make up a majority of RippleNet transactions, but we're continuing to expand further into B2B and e-commerce payments in 2021. The world is becoming more digital. Customers expect convenience, low costs, secure and scalable services from their financial providers. Whether traditional FI or nimble fintech, our customers are delivering the next gen of financial solutions through RippleNet. Uh, RippleNet is enabling FIs to deliver solutions that were previously offered only by multinational banks without the cost and overhead of legacy systems. If you want to build the future of financial services, come join us. So I think a lot of people uh, were uh, noticing that he did use the term flip the switch for ODL over here. If only we could flip the switch on XR price. Uh, you know, a great little update here from the Ripple team. Uh, it's nice to see that despite the lawsuit, and even uh, Berla mentioned down here, 15 deals were signed after the SEC complaint was made. It's nice to see that Ripple's still moving forward, and 2021 is looking bright for the company, and hopefully XRP utility. And to me, it sounds as though, and I don't know if this was just a coincidence or not, uh, but it sounds as though Ripple is completely in line with what the world is talking about right now, at Davos in particular. And I wanted to bring up this clip from Ripple investor Glenn Hutchins, okay? Uh, this brought to us by 432 Hertz XRP. He's the co-founder of Silver Lake Partners. Uh, they did invest in Ripple. And he was on a panel with uh, Andrew Bailey and Hikmet Ursek. Uh, listen to what he has to say here put up a whole new way of using this digital currency technology uh, and a whole new set of products can be created around that. And it, we're now evolving into each um, particular company or each particular network that's created with a set of use cases has its own token. So we're, we're at a place now where there are going to be a proliferation of uh, tokens run on that networks based upon certain protocols. And so there, there will be multiple tokens that'll be used. And my guess is, and those will be driven by the use cases that we present to consumers to use those tokens. And then they'll come back, in my view, into things like protocol, into things like Bitcoin and stable coins for purposes of being a store of value. Okay, and I'm going to cut it there. So proliferation of tokens uh, and the use cases, that's what's going to drive the utility. There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all token, uh, I hate to say, because uh, there's so much uh, friction, I suppose you could say, in the world right now. And uh, there are a lot of different projects that do different things. For example, I'm invested in Ripple's XRP and I'm invested in VeChain's VET token. Uh, and those two particular cryptocurrencies solve different problems. I can't speak on the specifics of how they're designed, but uh, I'm assuming they were designed for two specific problems. And one does one thing really well and the other does the other thing really well. I don't know if they could be interchangeable, if VET could be used for cross-border payments or if XRP could be used for uh, supply chains. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is there are going to be a lot of tokens in this space. We will see some overlap, but the good thing about XRP is that there are so many people working on the XRPL that they are trying to expand use cases for XRP. And this, in my opinion, is what's going to make XRP and Ripple so successful. I wanted to bring you guys this tweet thread as well. Uh, this from Andrew Zell, unpopular long-term prediction. It will all or mostly be centered around CBDCs, he says. Whether people like it or not, the success of a project will depend on its ability to provide infrastructure, complement or expand CBDC's ability, not competing against CBDCs. And from the beginning, we heard this is what Ripple was going to do. XRP is not going to replace a fiat currency in a specific country. It is there to complement CBDCs. And Brad Gar House has said this from the beginning. We want to remove the friction. We want to make sure that uh, cross-border transactions, in, in that particular example, helps the system move freely and frictionless. And, uh, you know, there's an opposing viewpoint there because the, the big banks, they like that friction because that's where they make big money. Uh, but the small to medium-sized businesses, it democratizes them to be able to compete against the big guys. So there's this tug of war that we're talking about. Big banks, I could see being a little reluctant to jump onto RippleNet, but uh, I 
I think Anders L has hit the nail on the head. The CBDC, complementing CBDCs, is what's going to make a particular cryptocurrency uh, succeed, I think, down the road as well. Uh, XRP Kinglen here says XRP is the Amazon of payments. It's over for the rest, in my opinion. And uh, XRP Army News not agreeing necessarily. Some of the others, most likely, in my opinion. Uh, Brad Garlic in my house says, I agree. It's important to remember, as Glenn notes, new tech bounces around a bit trying to find good fits. As more people get exposed, more ideas about what it can solve come to light. I think we've been seeing that play out over time. I'm just going to play you guys one more clip from Glenn Hutchins here uh, with regards to the way cryptocurrencies have been developed over time. And he talks about this uh, unique problem of trying to find use cases after a project has been completed. Listen to this. Glenn, how do you see this? What are you so afraid of at night when you, when you go to sleep thinking about this? Uh, well, I'm worried about two, uh, primarily about... Uh, companies building products that can have uh, build, well, around which you can build profitable businesses uh, and a little bit of regulatory piece, which we can come back to in a minute. But on the first, the arc of creation of technology companies goes from math problem, the math solution, to engineering problem, to engineering solution, to product creation, to business model uh, cr construction around the, the product to company formation around the business model. Um, and in the digital currency world, we have the, the math problem is, of course, the Business Dean General's problem. The Bitcoin was the solution to the math problem. We spent much of the last five years taking that solution and trying to engineer products around it. And we sort of solved a lot, but not all the problems that came out of that. Uh, and now we're at the point where we're actually designing products and trying to see if they can find business models. And so what I spend most of my time worrying about is can we construct business models around some of these cool products that are being created, as you've done, uh, inside your company? Can we do that um, uh, across, across the industry? That's the, where the industry is in this development. It's where I spend most of my time. Okay, and I'll leave it there. So developing use cases around these currencies that have already been created. Uh, Brad Garlic in my house says, personally, I think it goes much deeper. They've started small cross-border and onto CBDC and interoperability and then onto reserve status with the SDRs. Uh, to be honest, says Nomad Hatter, I've always felt that this was the end game strategy. It's the big prize and the tech makes perfect sense to complement the use of CBDCs. MoneyGram is low hanging fruit and testing grounds. So suggesting that Ripple is using their partnership with MoneyGram to, uh, you know, as a guinea pig almost in order to be in order to prove a working concept for xrp so that they can be the dominant liquidity provider in uh, the grander scheme of things Anderzell agrees here 100 percent let's not forget guys Anderzell's tweet here xrp plus cbdc's he did a screen grab this section from ripples insights to continue driving fresh innovation in crypto and interoperability and payments we're focused on tackling central bank currencies as the future of fiat. Key to this will be our ongoing work with central banks and developing protocols that support the direct exchange of CBDCs on XRPL using XRP as a bridge currency. So if you were ever in doubt, zoom out. It looks as though Ripple is indeed still trying to prove themselves in this financial system. Although they have friends in high places, I think they need to still prove uh, their concept. MoneyGram is a great opportunity to do so, uh, specifically in the United States. Ripple has been partnering with uh, a lot of SMEs around the world to also prove their concept. And so how much proof does the world need, the people at Davos, before they can fully integrate XRP into the new financial system? I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.